When I'm speaking to you, I shall dispense with a mask for two reasons. One is that you know, it's hard to get enough oxygen through the mask to be able to speak. And Nancy told me that don't you dare wear that mask because I can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> so that being the case, uh, if you'll permit me this uh, one indiscretion. Now, there's a, an old, old saying that there's only two things in life that are certain, death and taxes. Now, if you want to know a little bit more taxes, just get with me after the services, and I, then we can have a meaningful discussion about that. And it may be that there's some in, this, in the world, just say the world in general, who have never paid taxes or never concerned about it. But there is absolutely, absolutely no one anywhere who can escape death. Uh, of course, unless the Lord comes first. But that has not always been the case. At the end of the sixth day of creation, God saw everything that he had made and described it as very good. Not just good, very good. But something disturbed this debt, death-free paradise and that certain thing was sin Genesis 2.17 and then first part of chapter 3 prior to sin there was no death after sin death reigned salvation was not possible without the creator making provision for man's reconciliation so what is this thing what is sin like anything of biblical truth, sin must be determined by some absolute standard of truth or else it is merely arbitrary. Your truth may say that a matter is right, but my truth about the exact same matter may say that it is wrong. In such a false uh, determination of truth, both can be right at the same time about one truth that is in direct opposition to the other truth. It is all a matter of attitude and the way you think about these things are so, you know, people say. Now the Bible says that sin is lawlessness, John, 1 John 3 and 4, and that sin is not imputed where there is no law, Romans 5, 13. Furthermore, it says that all unrighteousness is sin, 1 John 5, 17, and that all your, that is God's, commandments are righteousness, Psalms 119, verse 172. And as to the matter of truth, Jesus says, your word is truth, John 17, 17, which, of course, answers Pilate's query, what is truth? So it is that those who habitually practice sin have rejected God. Or as the letter to the Romans says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, Romans 1.28. So at one time, everybody knew God, but as the prophet Jeremiah said, they were not valiant for the truth, Jeremiah 9, verse 3. Therefore, apostasy prevailed. However, this apostasy does not just happen overnight. The eventual adoption of false doctrine is a process. It does not just happen in an instance. Even the unfaithfulness that becomes common in Israel did not occur until the third generation of Joshua's time, Judges 2 verse 10. Millions exist today who have never heard of the Bible or gospel truth. But the Bible says that when Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, he will take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Indeed, the Lord said that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, Hosea 4, verse 6. Now, how did mankind who 
uh, once knew God come to such a sad condition? Well, certainly it's because of the will. People are going to do exactly what they want to do regardless of the will of God on high. The Lord said, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Jeremiah 6, verse 16. It was not a matter of knowledge of the truth. They simply did not want to do it. The same was true of Johanan and the people who were with him. They petitioned Jeremiah to inquire what the will of the Lord was concerning whether they should go uh, down to Egypt and flee from the Chaldeans. Whatever answer Jeremiah received from his prayer to the Lord on their behalf, whether pleasing or displeasing, they swore to obey. The Lord told them to stay in the land and not flee to Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 16 through uh, all the way through chapter, uh, Jeremiah 42nd chapter. But they rejected the word that they had received through Jeremiah, accusing him of speaking falsely. Jeremiah 43, verse 2. They had their mind made up before they inquired of Jeremiah. They only wanted confirmation of what they had already determined to do. And they were mad when he didn't give it to them. This event characterizes the thinking of those who know God and his will, but follow their own will regardless. The psalmist asked, why do the wicked renounce God? It is because he has said in his heart, you will not require an account. Psalms 10 verse 13. The wicked, knowing what the will of the Lord is, does not believe that the Lord will hold them accountable for their actions. Paul said that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The evil person just doesn't believe it. As the prophet Hosea said, uh, wrote, you trusted in your own way. Hosea chapter 10, verse 13. Whatever punishment is promised, they say this calamity shall not overtake or confront us. Amos 9, verse 10. This sort of thinking is delusional at its very core. Nahum writes that the wicked is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. But the wicked are wise to do evil. Jeremiah 4th chapter verse 22. They do not believe in the omnipotence of God. They believe the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. Micah was addressing the people who were comfortable in the belief that they were pleasing to God solely because of their sacrifices. King Saul was disabused of this notion by Samuel. When Saul asserted that he obeyed the Lord, Samuel said, as the Lord has greater delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. This was not to obviate the necessity to offer sacrifices as required, but to offer sacrifices while being disobedient in other matters negates any good that would otherwise ensue from the sacrifice. Amos says, can two walk together unless they are agreed, Amos 3.3. 3. This axiom is true whether, the, whether two or more are determined to obey God, such as Shad, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel 3rd chapter, or have conspired to do evil, such as Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10. We are walking humbly with our God when we are in agreement with him. We are in agreement with him when we obey his commandments. 
however perfunctory obedience to commandments without the proper attitude towards God, that is, doing it in the way that God said to do it for the reason God said to do it, makes the obedience of none effect. James says to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up in James 4, verse 10. Peter says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Paul says not to set your mind on high things but associate with humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Romans 12, verse 16. Paul warned of those who engaged in a false humility which has the appearance of wisdom in a self-imposed religion. Colossians 2, verse 18 and 23. Who can forget the example of the Pharisee and the tax collector who both went to the temple to pray? <clears throat> and you remember this, uh, the Pharisee was very laudatory of himself, how great he was. And he compared himself to the tax collector and said, I'm not like him. The tax collector, of course, he stood afar off and beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <clears throat> and Jesus said that the tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the other. For he who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke the 18th, 18th chapter, verses 11 through 14. Who wants to be exalted? Surely it is those who set their mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Keeping things in perspective, we realize that when our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, Colossians 5, verse 1. And one of the key elements in being reconciled to God is repentance. Now, in terms of the things that one must do to be saved, there's generally no disagreement even among the denominations about repentance. So this is not really a denominational uh, difference. It's an individual difference. Getting a person to repent is very difficult. It involves a change of mind and a turning from sin and a turning to God. If you recall, you know, Jesus began his ministry with a call to repentance. And as I say, the call is addressed to the individual not to the nation as was done in the Old Testament. All are called to repentance. Acts 17, verse 30, he says, At these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, what happens to those who do repent? Now, I understand there's more things that must be done, but in Acts, the third chapter, verses 19, and 20 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. If you want your sins to be blotted out, you're going to have to repent. And what is the end of those who will not repent? In Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, it says, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, God wants everyone to repent. Second Peter 3, verse 9 says, He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, how, how do we come to repentance? Well, the goodness of God leads one to repentance. Romans 2, chapter verse 4 Said, so do you not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Now, in order to come to repentance, one must use the intellect. Now, the prophet Isaiah, it's recorded there that 
It says, come, let us reason together. Now, what is reason? Well, I guess you may come up with different uh, definitions, but think of it as a, a process of thinking in which you assemble all the uh, evidence that you can, you sort it, compare it, and you come to a conclusion about the way things are. So we, in coming to repentance, we have to come to a realization of the way things are, including our spiritual condition. So God appeals to our intellect, 2 Timothy verses 3, verse 16 and 17, all scriptures given by inspiration, you know this well, profitable for doctrine and for proof and for uh, correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So this scripture is, is the thing with which we must reason <clears throat> and compare and contrast and so forth with, so we can come to determination the way things are, and in this case, our spiritual con uh, condition. Second Timothy verses, chapter 2, verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's rightly dividing the word of truth as a process of reasoning. Now we must examine ourselves honestly and in relation to an absolute standard. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, it says, Examine yourselves as to whether or not you're in the faith. Well, you've got to know what the faith is, and you have to know what is a viable procedure of self-examination. It's very difficult to do. Test yourselves. What well, testing is you make an assumption about yourself. You have this absolute standard. And you compare your, what your um, assumption is with that standard and see if you're in conformity with it. Godly sorrow produces repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7th chapter 8 through 10, you can read that at your leisure. But he says there, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrow, sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner. Now keep in mind, sorrow itself is not repentance. Verse 10, it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance. It is not repentance, it produces it, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Both had sorrow. Those that died spiritually <coughs> still had sorrow. Now you recall the the uh, when Jonah finally preached to the Ninevites, mm -hmm. and it was a very you might call it a harsh message, but he dealt in reality, and they believed it, and they repented. Now later on they may have uh, had a relapse, but nevertheless at, at uh, Jonah's preaching they did repentance. And you recall the uh, uh, story of the, the prodigal son? That's in a series of parables, you know, lost coin, lost sheep, and the uh, prodigal son. They're all dealing with the same thing. But keep in mind that that's in Luke uh, 15, uh, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. We keep in mind that the coin, the coin was lost. He had no idea. It had no idea that it was lost. It was not a sentient being. Now the sheep knew that it was lost, but didn't know what to do about it. So there had to be someone to uh, rescue it. But the lost son, he did some reasoning. He examined his condition in, in light of the uh, absolute truth that he had grown up with. And it says in verse 17, but when he came to himself, so I know from this that those that are in sin can use reasoning and come to a conclusion about their spiritual condition. So those who say uh, they're always complaining about you know, how, what problems they're having, this, that, and the other, I know they're not uh, uh, applying proper reasoning. They don't come to themselves 
But the prodigal son came to himself, and as a result, he uh, returned to his father's household. Now, you recall some of those who were engaged in sin. Now, King David, you know uh, the story about him and Bathsheba and how he tried to cover up his sin, like, you know, Second Samuel chapters 11 and 12. Now, when he was confronted with it, a truth that he could not escape, he indeed did repent. But one thing we must keep in mind about repentance, yes, our sin may be forgiven, but we must still suffer the consequences of that sin, even if we have been forgiven. So David, though he repented, still had to suffer the consequences of his sin. Now, Judas also came to a realization of his sin. But he didn't have godly sorrow. He had sorrow of the world. So what did he do? He says, I have sinned. Well, he's right. He had sinned by betraying innocent blood. So what did he do? He went out and hanged himself. Well, that's not an appropriate response to uh, the realization of sin. Now, he recalls the story of the rich young ruler that occurs in three of the Gospels, Gospel accounts, but let's, I'll just give you Matthew 19, chapter verses 16 through 22. And he came to Jesus and <clears throat> said, you know, what uh, more do I need to do uh, that I may have eternal life? And Jesus enumerated a number of things that he needed to do, and he said, I've done those for my youth. He said, one more thing you need to do. If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And that is a problem for those who need to repent. There's something of this world that they want to hang on to, and they just cannot give up. But the reality of this existence is that death must come to us all. In Psalm 89th chapter, verses 48, it says, What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? And, of course, you recall Paul saying that, that uh, it is appointed for man wants to die in there after the judgment. Precious is the death of the faithful saint. Psalms 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint. <clears throat> but what if you're not a saint? Or what if you are a saint and you have rejected and fallen out of fellowship with God and with uh, fellow Christians? Well, that death is not precious in the sight of of the Lord. It is to be greatly lamented. Those who die in such condition have no hope. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 13, he's talking about the Gentiles, that therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. <clears throat> so those who are in sin, who are unfaithful, who have never obeyed Christ, have no hope. But how do we overcome death? Look at 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 50 through 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will, be, will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, <clears throat> and we shall be, be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, <coughs> then, <coughs> then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to be to God, who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you are not in this spiritual condition, then you are lost, looking forward to a, a, eternal uh, punishment. Now, again, as I say, <clears throat> unless the Lord comes first, we all are facing death, death of this physical body. When will that come? We don't know. You know, I always heard about the, uh, it was kind of a joke about the, uh, <clears throat> what's the difference between an actuary and a Sicilian actuary? An actuary knows how many people will die this year. A Sicilian actuary knows their names. You have to think about that a while. But the reality is we're going to, we face death. We don't know when. So it's incumbent upon us that we be prepared, that we remain in a spiritual condition that is pleasing and acceptable to our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are not in that condition, we ask that you make that correction now as we stand and sing. Gary.